Hello everyone, my name is Jin Yang. In this video, I will present our work about vectorized linear approximations for attacks on source regime. This is a joint work with Thomas Johansson and Alexander Maximov. Me and Thomas are from Lund University, while Alexander is from Ericsson Research. My presentation will follow this outline, so I'd like to first give the motivation of our work. I'd like to give some background about the confidentiality and integrity protection in cellular networks. So in FTE, there are three standardized algorithms for the confidentiality and integrity protection, which are Synos 3G, AES, and SOOC. And they are all used for 128-bit security level. Well, when we, when we come to 5G, 3GPP has suggested to use 256-bit secret key and uh, algorithms to resist against uh, quantum computing. So uh, one possible solution for the 5G confidentiality and integrity algorithms could be to reuse existing algorithms. And the advantage is obvious since existing circuits can be reused. However, the security of these algorithms under the 256-bit key length should be carefully investigated to make sure that they can actually provide 256-bit security. So that is the motivation of our paper. We have given linear cryptanalysis of Snow 3G. Specifically, we have given a distinguishing attack with complexity to the power of 172 and a correction attack with complexity to the power of 177. And these uh, attacks indicate that Strong 3G cannot achieve the full 256 bit security. Next, I would give some details of the Snow 3G cipher. Snow 3G is a stream cipher with a linear part and a non-linear part. The linear part is a linear feedback shift register with 16 stages while the long linear part is a finite state machine with three memories. The F star is defined over the finite field of order to the power of 32. So every value in a cell is 32 bits, uh, thus giving 512 bits in total. The feedback polynomial is given here, where it has two special coefficients, alpha and uh, the inverse of alpha, where alpha is the root of a polynomial in the finite field of order to the power of eight. For the update, in each clock, every value in a cell is shifted to the right cell, while S15 is updated according to S11, S2, and S0 using, uh, according to the feedback polynomial. After that, S15, S5, and S0 are used to update the FSM and to generate the key stream block. For the FSM, it takes S15 and S5 as the input, and the output will be used to, X or, uh, to be XORed with S0 to generate the key stream block ZT. So specifically, ZT is generated by adding R1 and S15, and then XORed with R2 and S0. Um, then the registers are updated. R1 is updated by adding R2 and the XOR sum of R3 and S5, while R2 and R3 are updated from R1 and R2 through uh, two S transforms, S1 and S2, respectively. Here, S1 and S2 are 32 bit, two 32 bit uh, S transforms. The picture shows the construction of the S transforms, which are composed of four. Uh, Byte-wise S boxes followed by the mixed column operation in AES. So S1 can be expressed as L1 times SR, where SR is the AES uh, S box, while L1 is the mixed column matrix in AES. While S2 can be expressed as L2 times SQ, here the S box SQ is derived from the Dixon polynomials, while L2 is um, the mixed column matrix in AES as well. Next, I uh, would we'll give some details uh, of the linear cryptanalysis uh, we have on Snow 3G. We would uh, first uh, give the linear approximation of the FSM we have found. Then we show how we use it to give a distinguishing attack and a correction attack. 
Before I go into the details, I'd like to first to give some basics for the linear coordinates of stream ciphers. The basic idea is to approximate nonlinear components as linear ones and further to derive some linear relationships. If this linear relationship involves both the alpha states and the K stream symbols, it would result into a correlation attack. Well, if these linear relationships only involve K stream symbols, it will give a distinguishing attack. For the linear approximation, if we express the output uh, K stream symbol Z as the output from a nonlinear function NF, we can approximate it as a linear function LF plus the noise E, which would be biased. Usually, a linear approximation is binary, but in our paper, we consider the general vectorized linear approximations. Suppose the uh, noise E has distribution D, we can, using, we can use the SEI, which is squared Euclidean imbalance, to evaluate it. The SEI is defined as the sum of the squared differences between each entry of the distribution and the uniform probability, and then uh, multiplied by the dimension of the distribution D. It's well known that uh, uh, the required samples to distinguish E from London is around 1 uh, over epsilon. And we can see the noise E evaluates the quality of the linear approximation. And the key point of linear group analysis is to find a good approximation with the large buyers. Recall that uh, the FSM takes S15 and S5 as an input and the output is XORed with S0 to generate a K stream block ZT. Thus, we would like to explore linear expression, including only S15, S5, S0, and Z for attempts to I, such that this uh, linear expression is biased. Here, the C values are the linear masking matrices. The SEI of this linear expression evaluates the quality of the approximation, and the goal for us is to find a good time set I and a good masking matrices such that the SGI is as large as possible. Since uh, the FSM has three registers, we would like to consider three consecutive K stream blocks to cancel them out. If we know the values of R1, R2, R3, and S5 at clock T, we could get the values of R1, R2, and R3 at clock T minus one and clock T plus one, which are shown in the block. Correspondingly, we could get the key string symbols at these three consecutive time instances, and uh, which are shown in the block. For the key string block at clock uh, T plus one, we use the linear masking matrix, which is the inverse of L1. We then build a 24-bit linear approximation. Specifically, we combine the first bytes of each k-stream block to build a 24-bit uh, variable, which is denoted as zt here. While for the expression on the right side, we divide it into three parts. The last part is the linear part, which is denoted as st. Uh, it is contributed from the F sharp, while the first two parts are nonlinear, denoted as N1t and N2t, which are regarded as the noises, and they are independent to each other. So if we approximate zt as the linear part st, we would get a, a noise nt, which equals to N1t x or in N2t. Uh, and we would like to know the distribution and the bias of the noise. Since N1T and N2T are independent, we could get their distributions and the biases independently. For N1, it's easy, since we only need to loop over the first bytes of R1 and S15 with complexity to the power of 16. Well, for N2, it's complicated, since there are four 32-bit variables, which are R2, R3, S5, and S15, 
and it's impossible to get the distribution by looping over all of them. So we need some smart way. The smart way is to split the involved variables and also the noise expression into a smaller field. And we then compute the sub-distributions in this smaller field and combine them to get the full distribution. So the, the figure shows how it works. We can see R2, R3, S5, and S15 are divided into four bytes. And correspondingly, some functions are also divided into four sub-functions. And thus, the uh, distributions for, uh, for every byte can be computed and the combined in the end to get the full distribution. And we would like to mention here that uh, we need to consider the carries between different bytes. First, to watch how the Mach transform can be used to speed up this process. Uh, the complexity is around to the power of 41, and the bias is around to the power of minus 29. The total bias is around to the power of minus 37. And if we consider uh, the XOR sum of four such independent noises, the bias would be to the power of minus 163. Then someone would ask, if the derived bias is correct, and we answer it by providing experimental verification. Recall that for a distribution Px with bias epsilon, around one over epsilon number of samples are needed to distinguish Px from random. So if with one over epsilon number of samples, we can distinguish Px from random, we can conjecture that the bias of Px could not be much smaller than epsilon. The tool for the distinguishing is a hypothesis testing, where hypothesis H0 indicates that the sample distribution follows the computed noise distribution, while uh, H hypothesis H1 indicates that it follows the uniform distribution. The callback leveler divergence can help to make the decision. The KL divergence between two uh, distributions, X and Y, measures the difference between them. And the closer X, Y is, the smaller the KL divergence would be. So if the KL divergence between the sample distribution and the noise distribution is smaller, it will give the decision that this sample distribution follows the noise distribution. Otherwise, it follows the uniform distribution. Recall that ZT equals STXORs NT. And if we XOR ZT and SG, the result would be NT, which would be biased. So we can collect many samples of ZT, XOR, XORs, the SG, and verify if uh, this sample sequence follows the noise distribution or the uniform distribution. So we have run 64 Snow 3G instances and each up to, to the power of 40 iterations. In each iteration, we build a sample XT by XORing ZT and SG, whose detail is given in the bracket. And at the same time, we also build random sequences by collecting the lower 24 bits of the k stream symbols. Then for each of these sequences, either the sample sequence or the random sequence, we check which distribution it follows. And it, uh, there could be two types of errors. Type one errors where a noise distribution is judged as random and type two errors where a random distribution is judged as biased. The picture shows the results of the error probabilities under different lengths of samples. We could say that the error probabilities decrease with the increase of sample lengths. And at the length of to the power of 40, both error probabilities are smaller than 0.1. At the length of to the power of 41.5, there are no errors out of our 21 sample sequences. So with eight 
to 16 times 1 uh, divides epsilon number of samples, we could distinguish the same sequences with large success probabilities. And uh, we could say that the bias should be correct. So next, we would use this linear approximation and this bias to give a distinguishing attack and a correction attack. A distinguisher can distinguish in the key stream sample sequence from random. We recall again that the XOR sum of ZT and ST equals to NT. If ST can be cancelled, ZT would become biased, and with enough samples, ZT can be distinguished from random. Then the main question becomes how to cancel out ST. The idea is to find a time set I with usually three, four, or five time instances, such that the XOR sum of the alpha contribution at this time instances is zero, and correspondingly, the XOR sum of the key stream samples at these time instances uh, equal to the XOR sum of the noises, and which would be biased. Uh, this process is equivalent to finding a multiple of the generating polynomial Px of weight 3, 4, or 5, with all coefficients being 1. And there is already some research into this problem. And we will use the method from a paper in 2014 to find a weight 4 multiple Kx with time and storage complexity, complexities to the power of 172. Suppose the four time instances are T4, T3, T2, and T1, then the XOR sum of the uh, alpha contribution from these four time instances would be zero. Besides, any time shift T of Kx, which is x to the power of T times Kx, are still weight for multiples. And this means that the XOR sum of the alpha contribution from these these four time instances shifted by t clocks are still zero. Then we could uh, build new bias to key stream samples for different t values where, uh, where the uh, sample uh, at clock t x t equals to the XOR sum of the key stream samples at these four time instances uh, shifted by t clocks and the result would be the XOR sum of the noises. If we, cons if we regard, regard this, uh, these noises as independent, the bias would be to the power of minus 163. However, there is actually some dependence between these noises. So the bias would be even larger than to the power of minus 163. So the data complexity is upper bounded by two to the power of 163. So till now we have given a distinguishing attack uh, with time, storage, and data complexities or far below two to the power of uh, 256. We also give a correction attack. A correction attack is usually modeled as a decoding problem in the binary field or binary extension field. The picture shows the model. So the alpha initial state S with length L is regarded as the information symbol. While the alpha output U with a much longer length N is regarded as a code word. Here we would like to mention that every element uh, UI of U might not be the exact output of the alpha but could be some linear combinations of the linear of the alpha states. The code word U can be uh, generated by the multiplication of the information symbol S with a generation matrix G. The received code word, which could be the some linear combinations of the case stream samples. Uh, y could be regarded as the noise version of the code word U. So every element yi equals to ui uh, 
XORs with uh, alloys EI. Uh, from the coding theory, we know that when the code rate R is smaller than the channel capacity, there always exists a decoding method which can successfully uh, recover the information symbol. Recall that a decoding problem is usually defined over the binary field or a binary uh, extension field. Thus, our 24-bit approximation could not be directly used. So instead, we build a new 8-bit approximation by XORing every byte of the noise. Uh, but here we use two linear uh, masks, lambda and gamma, applied on the first and last byte of the noise. We searched for different values of lambda and gamma, and the best one is given here, which gives us the bias to the power of minus 41. Then we could get the every uh, element of the code word uh, ut and uh, the received code word yt and here we could see they are the uh, combination the, they are the linear combinations of the alpha states or the k-stream blocks then the task is to recover the information symbol s according to the received y sequence and it consists of two stages uh, during the pre-processing stage many parameter checks are generated, while during the processing stage, the decoding is performed. We use the method uh, from the paper of Bin Zhang in Crypto 2015 to give the correction attack. During the pre-processing stage, many parameter checks involving fewer alpha states are generated, and uh, the decoding requires parameter checks to the power of 172, uh, the time and the space complexities is 2 to the power of 177. During the processing stage, a distinguisher is built, and this distinguisher would be biased if a guess of the alpha states is correct, otherwise it would uh, be random-like. First, what transport can help to compute the bias of the distinguisher. The decoding complexity is to the power of 175 and 160 bits are recovered. We also give a 16-bit correction attack with similar complexity but fewer parity checks. So that's our work. To conclude, we have given linear cryptanalysis of SNOW 3G. We have found a 24-bit linear approximation with bias two to the power of minus 37. We verified these bias by connecting a large number of samples. We then use this linear approximation to give a distinguishing attack with complexity to the power of 172 and a correction attack with complexity to the power of 177. This linear cryptanalysis results indicate that if the k-length in SNOW 3G would be increased to 256 bits, there are academic attacks on it. But we would like to mention here that these attacks are not an immediate threat for 5G, since in cellular networks, the lengths of the key streams are usually restricted, thus we cannot get enough uh, data. That ends my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.